Today, on Commitment to Truth. One of the warnings and cautions I, caution I give new married couples is that there's a place reserved in your heart only for Jesus. And your spouse, how beautiful she is, how handsome he is, how much you love each other, will one day attempt to dethrone Jesus, or you will attempt to put them in a place in your heart that they don't belong, but only reserved for Christ. Welcome to Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Each week, Pastor Cedric Brown and the pastoral team at Commitment Church strive to draw you into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Valentine's Day is a wonderful time when we reflect on the love we have for our mate, whether that's a spouse or a spouse-to-be. If you're married, or even if you're soon to be married, it is important to understand that God makes husband and wife one flesh. In today's message, Pastor Cedric Brown will teach us how we can maintain the oneness of flesh by keeping Christ at the center of our relationships, cultivating trust, and courageously cleaving with your spouse. Here is Pastor Cedric, lead pastor of Commitment Church, with today's message. So make us one in marriage. Uh, there's a few passages of scripture we like to first begin with. Lisa, you can read the first. Okay? In the beginning it was said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 2.24. And then Jesus affirmed when he, of course, uh, spent time here on this earth, and he said this, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, Matthew 19, verse 5. And then he goes on to say in Mark 10, 8, two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two, but one. The Apostle Paul reaffirmed, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, Ephesians 5, 31. So this becoming one flesh, right, Lisa, mm -hmm. you want to... Uh, start us off. There are three non-negotiables to becoming one in marriage. First, keep Christ at the center. Amen. We got to keep Christ mm -hmm. at the center. How does that look? Uh, one, it is the willingness to be crucified with him. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in, this, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Mm -hmm. That's it in a nutshell. Uh, we have to be willing to die to self and let the Christ in us live so that we can rightly judge and see our spouse for what they are. Mm -hmm. So we enter, what we've learned is that we enter marriage uh, to fully represent Jesus and just serve each other. <laughs> Absolutely not, right? Mm -hmm. Normally we enter marriage and it's all about us. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm lonely. You know, I'm, I'm, a I'm aging out of the marriage game and I want to get married. You know, I want to be uh, sexually pure, so I want to get married. You know, so a lot of times it's, it's, and most of the time it's all about us. Mm -hmm. It's about my white picket fence mm -hmm. dream whatever context and wherever that looks for you and for me. But what we've realized is that um, the challenge will always be is that now that I'm married to you, you now become this instrument mm -hmm. so I can fulfill everything that I want to be and everything that mm -hmm. I want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's always the caution mm -hmm. because we do it so subtly mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it kind of, it kind of, raises this ugly head in many, many different ways, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Instead of being the partner that God designed you to be, I'm using you to get what I, basically what I want yeah. and how I see my life yeah. to be. In other words, I want Lisa mm -hmm. to become something that satisfies me. Mm -hmm. I want, you know, so I begin to nitpick her and why don't you do how you say it that way? Why you do it that way? Why you dress that way? Why you call me hair that way? Why you do this? Why you do that? I want you to tweak yourself so that I can feel better about me rather than really appreciating the woman that God has created before me. Listen to this, to ultimately, yes, to become an instrument, but more of like a chisel, you know, to make me more like Jesus. And, 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 uh, and that becomes where, that's where it becomes very difficult and complex because something I thought was going to be so precious all the time 
some way finds itself being painful, you know, and agonizing, frustrating, and difficult. And so many people quit. Matter of fact, 50% of people get married, quit. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so the challenge is always, it really isn't about me. Now, one thing I want to side note, to sidestep to say, you know, you hear partner, well, listen for the record, one man, one woman for one lifetime. Amen. We're not talking man with man, we're one with woman, is one man, one woman for one lifetime. Amen? Amen? All right, so when you hear partner, you know, it's not, it's not a partner in crime, it's not a partner of a, a, the same sex, but it is one man, one woman for one lifetime. Uh, and that's the heart of God. So that being said, again, uh, you, it is very easy to use the partner or the helpmate that God has given you and wants you to live your, your rest of your life with and just really have a wonderful experience together. Because honestly, listen, no matter how painful marriage is, it is the most precious gift that God has given to mankind. How do we know this? It's because God uses this, if you would, terminology of man or woman, husband, wife, to communicate uh, his love for his people. He's done that with the children of Israel. You know, they were his, his bride. He was their, their God. But yet also, he said that if you sin against me, you've created, created, uh, committed excuse me, adultery towards me. So it was very personal, right? And that's why marriages are so much under attack and, and are trying to be redefined. Because if you can attack and or dismantle marriage, you ultimately dismantle the work of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So therefore, again, uh, there's this responsibility to keep Christ in the center of it all. And it begins with what? Dying, dying to myself. To self. Dying, you know, to self. dying to myself. We have, we have to be willing to be vulnerable before God. You know, okay, God, I'm coming, in, I'm coming into this marriage and I'm going to let you wheedle out those parts of me that won't be best for the marriage. For example, I, I was raised in a, a female-dominated household. You know, she was running the show. She, she was the only one that was running the show. So it was, it's the, sometimes the transfer to when you're coming into a marriage, I ain't giving up my position. I ain't giving up my hmm, I ain't following him. But we have to be vulnerable to God and let him fix those places in us mm. that have left those wounds and those ideals in our head. Yeah, so here's the precious thing about the work of God in your life when you let Christ to become the center is that it's likened to if you walk down the street and you see a, a human being with two heads, four eyes, four ears, four legs, four arms, you follow me? duplicate parts of the body and that's kind of how we enter marriage it's like i'm keeping that part i'm keeping that i'm keeping that you know he says two should become what in other words something a part of you must go so there's something called phantom pain you know what that is hmm. that you lose a limb mm -hmm. you still feel it you feel the pain you feel the absence of it, it happens in marriage Part of you is cut away, and then you feel that pain. You feel that absence, like, oh, man, I, you know, I'm losing myself. Well, yeah, absolutely, because the scripture says you lose yourself, you do what? You find it. You die, you live. Mm -hmm. So what God does is he, he kind of uh, exacerbates that and causes that to happen a little quicker and a little more uncomfortably in marriage to ultimately cut away what doesn't need to remain to ultimately make you one. But here's the, the other blessing of that. He keeps the best part of you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and makes you better. Mm -hmm. That's the beautiful thing he does is that, you know, even though like Lisa just described, her context was, no, a woman's in control. Woman's, woman's you know, can't trust a man, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. well, part of that had to die. Mm -hmm. Had to die. So our marriage could live. live. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So God will chisel away those things that you thought were necessary to ultimately allow your marriage to become one flesh. Over the years, I have encountered countless people who do not feel loved by their parents, their spouses, their children, or anyone at all. This unloved feeling, I've also witnessed, possesses the power to cause them to ponder the seemingly never-ending question. Does God love me? 
Like them, I too have wrestled with this frustrating question, which eventually manifested itself in many tangible ways, such that those closest to me found themselves engulfed by their flames. You can purchase this book and others by Cedric Brown at cedricbrown.com. So keeping Christ at the center also is the willingness to keep him first place in everything. So he must be the center, but he also must be first place. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18 says this, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn born from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Mm -hmm. And everything is everything. Everything is everything, even in the context of your marriage, that he wants to be first place. Now, here's the challenge, though. Your spouse... And again, I'm a spouse as well. We will knowingly or unknowingly seek to dethrone or outrank Christ. One of the warnings and cautions I, caution I give new married couples is that there's a place reserved in your heart only for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And your spouse, how beautiful she is, how handsome he is, how much you love each other, will one day attempt to dethrone Jesus, or you will attempt to put them in a place in your heart that they don't belong, mm -hmm. but only reserved for Christ. Mm -hmm. So Lisa, you, you have something <laughs> you want to share, right? I know early in our marriage, I struggled. I was, I was jealous of God. I was jealous of Cedric's relationship with God because I thought he's supposed to be loving me more. And it, it bothered me that he was so gun ho and and after God and God came first and everything. And I'm like, I'm your wife. I'm supposed to come first. <laughs> you know, what, what, what's the problem? But as I went on, God began to show me that as he pursued Christ wholeheartedly, all that overflow, I got that. It fell over on me where I was taking care, where he was taught how to love me, lo love me as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. So listen to what Lisa said one day. She said, so do you just, do you love me because you love me or you love me because God's telling you to love me? I'm like, how, how can you back me in a corner like that, right? <laughs> but that's what, that was the conflict. He's like, wait a minute, you know, do you really love me, love me, or do you love me because God's telling you to love me? <laughs> and, and, and like Lisa appropriately said, it's, it's, it's not one or the other. You follow me? It's not one or the other. So the challenge is that we cannot make our spouses, listen, not even, it goes beyond spouses, mm -hmm. our children, our career, et cetera, et cetera, into an idol. Mm -hmm. Because we quickly can do that. Now, here's the challenge. You may say, well, how do I, how do, I do that? Or, no, I don't. Well, this is the way God shows me that uh, there's a, there's a hot button or there's a way that Lisa can become my idol. If Lisa, when there's times in my life that Lisa will say something a certain way and it will cause a part of me on the inside to act unbecoming of a Christian. <laughs> you say, okay, well, well, I don't act that way, but your spouse will say something, do something, make you think unbecoming of a Christian. <laughs> you follow me? And Jesus says, you think it in your heart, so is he. So is you, right? Mm -hmm. So as a man think of it in the heart, so is he. So the challenge we face is, is that to me, I've kind of landed there. Is that's, that's one of my indicators. If am I going to allow uh, uh, Lisa to dethrone Christ in my heart based upon what she says, what she does, what she doesn't say, what she doesn't do? Same thing with children, right? Children don't call you. Then you get when they grown, don't call you. What happens? You get upset. You, you can't. You can't set. You're setting them up for failure when you make them your idol because yes. they're going to disappoint you because they can never fulfill the longing that that natural longing that God has put in you. And as time goes on, right time, temperature, and situation, you gonna find out. Oh, they're not so great. They're yeah. not so. All, all in all, Jesus is your only Amen. all in all. Amen. Amen. So therefore, he must be your focus. He must be your center. And the beautiful thing about that is it's no different than when he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things and part of things are what? Marriage. Mm -hmm. 
you seek him and you go hard after him, he'll make sure you're loving your wife as Christ loved the church and gave his very life for her. He'll make sure that you're respecting and honoring your husband. He'll make sure that you're loving your children and loving your parents and, and doing a good job you know, uh, in your career and being successful. But it's kingdom first. You follow me? Whenever we flip the narrative, it then begins to become idolatry. In any context, it's idolatry. So when Christ, so therefore Christ, when he is uh, made first, God supernaturally, some way, somehow, it's almost like he supernaturally convinces your spouse that there's no one else but her, but him. You follow me? It it really kind of affirms that you appreciate them and you really do love them. Yeah, there's a season like Lisa went through. It's like, oh, what about me? Is you between me and God? You got to choose. Well, you never want to put your spouse in that predicament to choose, you know, uh, you over God, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a scary place to be. That's a, that's a scary place to be Mm -hmm. scary place to be. But what God would do is that when you keep him in the center, when you keep him first place, he will affirm in your spouse's heart that I am special to him. I am special to her. You know why? It's because he will supernaturally tell you things, show you Mm -hmm. things that would affirm your love to your spouse in ways you can never think or imagine. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. Christ must always be your all in all. So here's our second uh, point. You never stop cultivating trust. Cultivating trust, one, is inspired by Christ's love for us. Two, is trusting him, which helps helps us love vulnerably. (laughs) First John 4, 18 through 19, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because, because he first loved us. Mm. Trust and love, trust and love is synonymous. Trust and love is tethered together. You cannot have one or the other. You can't say, oh, I love you, but then I don't trust you. You can't say, oh, I trust you, but I don't love you, right? Uh, but both Trust and love creates a, a great sense of vulnerability. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that you, you have access, Lisa has access mm-hmm. in my life where no one else mm-hmm. can go. Then on the flip side of that, Lisa, because she has access in those areas, is the only one on this planet can touch me, move me, provoke me in ways that I can't even think or imagine. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Right? To touch me emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. All the characteristics of a man or woman. That's what marriage does because there is this greater sense of vulnerability. So the challenge we face is this. If we do not trust God, we might never trust our spouse. Because for me to get to a point that I completely trust Lisa, oh, wow, I better, better, better trust God. I better trust God because it's going to look scary. It's going to be different. It's going to be awkward. Listen, there's things that I do now that I never thought I would do. <laughs> right? And, and, and I had to do it to affirm trust. You follow me? In my spouse, my wife. But I needed to trust God to go to those different places. You follow me? That then it do, all it does is just enhances, affirms our love for each other. Make sense? So in other words, do we trust God enough to deal with our spouses on our behalf? Right? Right. Because what do we normally do, baby? We retreat. We retreat and we try to we try to fix it. Our, I'm sorry, try to fix it <laughs> and try to fix it, fix it ourselves. But we and we cannot. You cannot change anybody. As wonderful as you are, you cannot change anybody. But you have access to the Father, hmm. who can work on the person's heart. The King's heart is in the um in God's hand. He can turn it any which way He wants to. So you need to go to the Father on behalf of your spouse. Pray for them and give God time to move. So we want it done yesterday. We are a microwave society. Okay, God, I told you about it today. I want it done tomorrow. But we have to give God time to work in the situation and also work in you because this is not a one-way street. Because usually if there's issues with him, 
or her there's issues with you there's something god is trying to bring out in you while he's dealing with your spouse mm. and be patient how patient was god with you mm. how patient god didn't bail out on you why would you bail out on your marriage amen now this is especially especially difficult if there's mistrust moral failures and not to mention childhood trauma or trauma from another relationship and you come in right you bring in you bring in all this with this bag is a Samsonite luggage that you start am, unpacking in the context of marriage. And, and now it becomes complex. It becomes extremely difficulty, difficult, extremely emotional. But yet, it's, if there is going to be this oneness, there is this cultivating. That's why we, we attach cultivating. Because you never stop. You never start planting. You never stop tilling soil. You never stop. It never stops on this side of heaven that you must continually cultivate trust cultivate trust uh, because there you will fail your spouse you will disappoint her you will disappoint him and you will bring in some form of trauma period hello my name is sarah vega and i am the administrative and executive director here at commitment church i hope you've enjoyed today's message by pastor cedric brown if you didn't know pastor cedric also sends out encouraging videos weekly we call these the Weekly Wire. We can send these encouraging videos directly to you by subscribing at www.loveallnations.org. Here's an example of the encouragement you'll receive. Are you in a difficult situation right now? Are you up against something that seems to be insurmountable, something difficult? Something that probably has crept in from your past that is in your present or something in your future that you have to address and it is very difficult for you at this moment. You see, there's a Bible verse that says this. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too difficult for me? You see, no matter what you're up against, good, bad or indifferent, maybe you have failed God in the past, but yet you have repented and asked for his forgiveness. Remember, is anything too difficult for him to handle for you? Maybe again, you're, you're in over your head because of uh, your job or being a father or mother or just trying to navigate college or school. Please know, the God of all flesh says to you, is there anything, absolutely anything too difficult for him? Don't lose heart. No matter what the difficult situation is, it is never, ever too difficult for God. We hope you enjoyed the sample of our Weekly Wire. Again, to subscribe to your weekly inspiration, refreshment, and encouragement, please visit www.loveallnations.org. Thank you again for listening to our Valentine's Day message from Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Genesis 2.24 says, A man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Valentine's Day is a great day when husband and wife can celebrate that wonderful gift of God, the oneness of flesh, and a great time to remember how to maintain that oneness. If you want to listen to the previous messages in this series, or if you want to hear messages from other series, visit Commitment Church on YouTube, or Pastor Cedric Brown on Spotify, Pandora, or other podcast providers. You can also visit us on our website, commitmentchurch.org. And if you live in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey area, we would love to see you in person as well. You can attend any of our services by visiting us at 2 Berlin Road South, Lindenwald, New Jersey, 08021. Thank you again for listening, and have a blessed and wonderful day.